and we're I think we're recording. We are definitely recording. All right. It was like a awesome lag. So what is going on, ladies and gentlemen? And that are awesome. I believe this is episode 006 of the podcast. Eddie, you're in charge of keeping track, right? So what episode are we on right now? Well, it depends on if the last one makes it or not. So, so episode 6A. Um, this is actually a very awesome episode. John, I feel like this is way overdue, not just like with a podcast episode here, but you and I just like shooting the shit for two hours, I think has been well overdue. Hours. That might be more chop dog than I can handle. I don't know, man. I mean, I can Snapchat this entire thing. So you have two hours worth of content to watch after this episode's over. I watch some of these blabs, and like some, sometimes they disappear. They fall asleep and shit. Is that okay if I do that one? No, I can. I can. Hey, if you want to fall asleep, be my guest. You're blab, man. You can do whatever you want here. <laughs> really? so, okay. Josh and I will just talk. In the meantime, we're snap you sleep. So we're, we're, hey, Stephen Caggiano's on. What's up, Stephen? How you doing, man? <laughs> Stephen is a good brand advocate and. Uh, Helper of uh, distribution and such, whatever. Everyone knows Stephen Caggiano in here, or some people do. Anyway. Hi, Steve. Hi, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> just so right there, right there, there. He just gave me like eighty props, so I'm like, there's Stephen. Oh. All right, I think it's time to get started. Let's jump into. Dude, how, was, how was a startup grind? Tell me how. What, all right, you guys had a good time. It was awesome, man. I mean, all right. I went two years ago when it was at the Computer Science History Museum of Computers and stuff. So, and that was awesome, right? I mean, and this was what, tripled amount of people that was there? It felt like it at least, up two years ago. Whole their venue, and the speakers were amazing. I really liked that there's those few speakers you knew had like no propaganda, no like political agenda. They were just like getting straight to the point, talking like the true things that most people don't talk about, right? And as well, I think the quality of people kind of went up at Startup Grind. It went from like maybe more, I'm an inspiring entrepreneur doing 25 things at once to now, you know, in line, we're hanging out with the head of Verizon Ventures, right? And talking to like more investors, entrepreneurs, like connected with my uh, some friends over at 43 North that had no idea it was going to be there. So I think the yeah. quality went up, production value hands down went up. And mm -hmm. I also think just like the people working at Startup Grind are just much more efficient. They know what they're doing. So, yeah, dude, and, and on top of being here in the East Coast, so, like, it being in the 70s and 80s was just, like, that cherry on top. Because we, we landed in Chicago the day after the event was over, and it was fucking brutal, man. I think Eddie and I actually started freezing as we started walking in our tracks, but it was awesome. As you were Snapchatting? Yeah, I remember. Yeah, as we were Snapchatting, man. That's, that's, that's the theme <laughs> of today's episode is why you should use Snapchat starring John. <laughs> um, here You're the we go. advocate again. <laughs> yeah, I saw Eddie's eyes roll so far back up into his head. It's like, mm, well, you see, Eddie is anti. Really can't Snapchat. escape this conversation. Yeah, no, this is this is the all right. Eddie's not anti Snapchat. I'm not. I'm not anti Snapchat. I'm. I'm just not trying to use Snapchat personally. I would say that Eddie is anti being around Josh, who's always doing Snapchat. Snapchat. But <laughs> I prefer to Snapchat for the both of us, actually. So that's how it works. If you want uh -huh. Snapchat, I could actually Snapchat less because distribution can be spread out more. No, so it's hard to argue with the same with amount. amount. Yeah. I mean, how many people are following you on Snapchat? Do how many people see I, your stuff? I don't know how many follow me because it doesn't tell you, but it's <laughs> averaging about like 1,800 views per story, give or take. Jesus. It's awesome. I mean, like Josh, for example. I don't know, Josh, how did you find this? I know Josh is always commenting on Snap, stuff like that. So figure we'll ask him. Josh, how did you find us on Snapchat? Oh, wait for Stalker. So Josh is nice. stalking. <laughs> so there you go. So, you know, Snapchat's great for putting out content. It's great for stalking. Um, you know, it's all, it's all those type of needs. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you, you found that, like, there hasn't been, like, as far as, like, I mean, because you're doing how many how many you know snaps would you say are you doing per story? On average, well, yeah, no, it's a good question. I think we're averaging a day right now when I do snaps about four mm -hmm. minutes of content a day, which is a lot of snaps. But you'll notice out of maybe the eighteen hundred, that's going to be your max you get a day. Sixteen hundred, eighteen hundred will actually listen to it for all the way through for the whole day, and that retention is unbelievable because I'm not getting that on Twitter. I'm definitely not getting that on Facebook. I'm not getting that on Instagram, but on Snapchat, it's so, you know, even with you, you're getting pissed off at me, like, your stats are way too long, but you're still actually watching them. You're engaged with them. 
you know. Well, I, I, would, I would say so. Is there a way to differentiate between you know, bump, 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 bump? Well, see, I actually I don't think so, and you probably could be doing that. I'm, I'm sure some people are. Uh, but, I will admit that you know I ain't gonna lie. I sometimes have, but it's not really like against you at all. It's just like oh shit, I get bump, bump, no, bump, yeah, totally. Bump. And then you're also that person. Yeah, like, I want to clear it out because it annoys me that I have a story I haven't seen. Oh, there's all that like psyche to it, but. The thing that's really blown my mind is like the amount of content that's getting people to look at other content. For example, Josh has literally found a lab before he's on here. I'm not talking third person. Uh, by yeah, finding yeah. a Snapchat, we post blog articles all the time, and we'll get like a flood of users, um, newsletter signups. Like it's, it's incredible. We've actually brought in leads, like leads to Chop Dog through Snapchat, who otherwise would have never contacted us before. And same with this podcast. Honestly, we started doing a podcast this year. This podcast has already brought us in new job opportunities. We're connecting with more influential people than ever before. The people who I knew in my networks, like you, for example, like I've always known you. You and I have talked briefly, but we've never like had that like huge like one-on-one friendship relationship. Like I just hit you up on a text message. But like half the people we have on the podcast afterwards, I've been closer with than ever before. So it's like all this content creation is also putting me a little bit out of our comfort zone to an extent and putting out more content, which is building our own brand, our own reach, and then our connections with amazing people. So it's like this. I don't know. It's like this huge cycle that's happening all at the same time. And it's been a huge asset for us. No, totally. I mean, it comes down at the end of the day to the whole idea of like signal and noise, right? If there's a lot of noise, it's a giant sea of noise. But if you want to try and get above that and be seen by people, then you need to have a signal, right? Like a radio signal, I imagine it as. And if you have a big account like that, whatever it may be, you're going to want to try and leverage that, whether it's yours or somebody else's whom you know or, or whatever the case may be. So yeah, what you got there's a signal that that's getting out and being seen by a bunch of people. Totally, and, um, and then we just pump that signal with literally as much noise as physically possible. <laughs> but, but I kind of feel like that's where the art comes into it. If there is an art, well, you got to create valuable mm -hmm. content, right? Like right now, what we're doing here is we're creating real content. We're we're not coming on here to like just as Gary Vaynerchuk would say, coming with a right hook here right away. Because you do that, people are going to get pissed the hell off. They're going to be like. All right, this this is stupid. There's an agenda to this. We're actually creating content for the purpose of like actually creating content, right? To help people. Like what we're going to talk about today is actually like real authentic stuff here. You know, it's not like let's talk the next two hours about you know what you're just doing and just about why you should work with Chop Dog. Because if we do that, then no one's going to listen, right? And instead, it's just us filling our own egos. But the cool thing is, is the hack, right? Because now by us talking about real content, you get that dividend or that result of doing that uh, except people are actually going to listen and they're actually going to care about the content you're talking about it's going to be impactful agreed <laughs> <laughs> so all right i want to start with this so for a lot of people listening and a lot of people are going to listen on itunes on soundcloud hopefully if google ever opens up their damn doors on google yeah they're just taking their we should ask tom when he's on our podcast in the future um you know, so one of my um, questions for you real quick is for those who don't know you, number one, actually, let's backtrack. Give us the best like 60 second or elevator pitch of who you are, what you do, and kind of like, yeah, just a general, you know, who is John? Yeah, I'm a longtime journalist. So I've been a journalist since, uh, I don't like the way I look in that shot. I'm going to go back to where I was. Um, <laughs> you got to watch the angles, man. It's like every five minutes change the angles up. Exactly. I'm a long-time journalist. I uh, started in journalism in 1994 um, in some capacity and like just did it all the way until I got involved with the internet in 1997. Or wait, no, uh, 2007. I got involved with it in terms of actually it being a job that I did. So that was 2006, 2007. And then uh, that was as a web producer at NBC Bay Area in San Francisco Bay Area and uh, did that for a couple of years. And from there, just moved on into online marketing and actually trying to get page views for people and eventually content marketing and PR and, and, and worked for agencies and startups and stuff like that over the last nine years. So yes, yeah, so that's that. That's awesome. Tell us a little bit, just cause I'm curious about what the Bay area was like in 2006 and seven. Oh, I mean, it, today. The thing is, is it's, it's like that whole, like the frog being, even though you, the frog that's in a, a pot and you slowly heat the pot, the frog never notices eventually it boils to death, which actually isn't true. Have you ever heard of that? Okay, so you've heard of yeah. it, Eddie. Anyway, so all I'm yeah. trying to say is that uh, is that over a long period of time, you sort of it changes a little bit by a little bit by a little bit. You don't really notice it as it's happening. Um, so uh, basically, there is this uh, analogy of like 
if there are political systems that are changing slowly and slowly and slowly and eventually maybe becoming like like in Star Wars, eventually an empire from having been a democracy, the changes that take place slowly over a long period of time, it's kind of like a frog being boiled slowly and the frog is just sitting in there enjoying it, but it's getting used to the water, getting hot very slowly. And the idea is that eventually it's going to die and boil to death. Um, <laughs> that actually isn't really a thing, though. But um, anyway... Uh, I'm getting distracted. I have a pretty crazy case of, of distraction. So hold on. There Distractionitis is a very real thing. Distractionitis. Um, so yeah, what was it like in 2007? Um, you know, about half the cars on the road in the city. Uh, the city's filled with cars. The idea that, you know, like Lyft and Uber are like making traffic so much easier because there's less cars on the road or some or less people driving their cars on the road. No, it's it's like there are more people living here anyway, um, and there's twice as many cars here, it feels like. It's harder to get everywhere. I kind of saw this like in 1999 and in 2000. That's the last time I, I saw something like this, when there was just even more people living here in a more concentrated way. A lot of them leaving and going south to go to, to, go to uh, Mountain View and Redwood City and San Mateo and all those places because that's where all the companies were back then. But there were more cars in general, and you could see it on Highway 101, you could see it on Highway 280, it was really on the peninsula going up to San, you know, up and down from San Francisco. So that's like a big thing is the traffic, you see the traffic, um, and it's back to the way it was back then. Things kind of imploded in, in 2000, 2001, and then there were, the freeways were clear again. So um, in 2007, it actually, there was kind of a, not a mini bubble, but it was the economy was doing pretty well at that point. Then it collapsed in 2008 again. And then we saw some inexpensive, more inexpensive situation here than, than usual. Right now it's $4,700 a month for a two bedroom on average in San Francisco. So, I mean, uh, the tech scene hasn't been, it, it, it has its positives, but it has its negatives as well. You know what I mean? So I want to ask the hard hitting questions right now, because I think you're going to have the perspective that most don't. You literally been in the Bay Area throughout all of this. You've seen the entire rise, like or to the to the greater extent of what it is right now. So my question for you is this, and kind of we talked about briefly before. For those who listen to this podcast and are thinking, I live in the middle of nowhere, Missouri. I'm going to move to the Silicon Valley and make it. You know, what is your feedback to someone who's like, why should I move to San Francisco? Or I'm thinking about moving to Palo Alto or you know Menlo or whatever. Like, what is your reaction? Are you, are you encouraging them? Like, all right, do it, or you're like, you're going to go bankrupt. Go somewhere. It, back in 2007, that was definitely more of a thing that you could do. 2008, 2009, I mean, it was cheaper there. Redwood City is is now finally getting to the point where it's not affordable at all. There's a couple little more hood-like spots that are that are um, that are more affordable. But back in say 2008, 2009, they were really affordable, less than a thousand dollars a month or fifteen hundred dollars a month for like a big studio or a two bedroom. So that was the way that was then. Um, in some places on the peninsula, aka the Silicon Valley. And there's plenty of places in, in San Jose still that are kind of shitty, but you'd have a commute. Um, and also the East Bay, Milpitas, Hayward, some of those places over there, you could find some not so great places even now. Under So just the first thing, number one, just like do all your homework and know what you're getting into and, and be obsessive and compulsive about understanding the information related to what it would be like to live in this place. Because it's there's 8 million people here now. It's really crowded. That's twice as many people as were here 40 years ago. Um, it's uh, it's really expensive. I mean, shit. I, I went to go get a juice. It was six bucks. So it's just like I, I don't even know. I don't even know what to say about it anymore. It's kind of discouraging because it's. It, like, I mean, I have enough to live here, and I. It's kind of the principle of the thing, though. It just costs so much to live here. Now, would you? So, you would you used to be in in the Bay Area to do what you're doing? You can be anywhere else, right? Yeah, you can. Um, I would say, though, that when it comes down to the hustle, when it comes down to the, the really important hustle that I think should be to at least make sure that you consider how it can be a very big part of uh, whatever startup you're doing or whatever company you're doing or whatever you're doing in your life. There, and it's, and you, you want to be connected to tech. You want to do something related to tech. You want to learn how to code. You want to learn how to design. You want to learn how to uh, market. You want to do all those things for a company, and that's what you want to do. You want to start your own company. It's really important to to hustle that shit in all sorts of different ways. Right. And I think that I think that's absolutely right. I think the Bay Area has a lot of opportunity that you wouldn't get anywhere else. And I was kind of mentioning this to my parents, which is funny because they were like, "Well, if you can do this from anywhere, why don't you just go to like somewhere in Texas or somewhere like that's cheaper to live in, and, and you could have like a lot more." 
material things that I'm like, you're not going to get the same networking opportunities and the same hustle in a city like Austin. Well, maybe not Austin. Austin's actually getting pretty, pretty good, but one of those cities as opposed to like Oakland or, or San Francisco or Redwood City. I would say, uh, well, so Oakland is the third largest city in the Bay Area, and there are 8 million people here. San Jose is the third largest city in California, the 10th largest city in the country. It has like 1.1 million people. It's part of the Bay Area. It's the largest city in Northern California. I mean, overall, shit, where do you even, where do you even attack this? Um, Silicon Valley, is, as far as that hustle and the connections of different people, everyone comes through here at some point. Yes, there are a lot of other great startup hubs. New York, Austin, Denver, Seattle, uh, shit, even Detroit, uh, even uh, Boston. You could go on and on. They're all they're all important. They all have like different sectors. San Diego is good for biotech. Uh, uh, L.A. has has a good you know burgeoning startup scene, but like nothing really has that like twice, three times, four times. Any night of, of the year, you can go to an event pretty much in the Bay Area and. And, and, and meet some people with the potential for finding new people to do biz dev with, to create relationships with, to, um, you know, whatever your goal is, you know, to, to help you with your business. Uh, find people who you can hire. Find people who can hire you. Just develop relationships. Meet journalists. Like half the different, like I, I would say 75% of all the times I speak publicly, it's about how to um, get press, how to build your brand. And so every time I talk about how to get press, like it always comes down to hustle. It always comes down to who you can meet, who you can know. Uh, you know, you obviously do your homework ahead of time, find out which reporters you are going to want to talk to about your area, whatever your startup is about or whatever you're doing. So you do that homework first, then you find those reporters who live near you or who live far away from you and you kind of half stalk them and you go and you discover their writing, you read the stuff they write, you see how you would fit into that, you pitch them properly, but maybe the pitching doesn't even come till later until after you get to know them and maybe you find out that he or she isn't somebody who you really wanna talk to because you don't like them anyway. So, but yeah, that's all part of, it all comes under the umbrella of hustle, like it's all a hustle. And, and San Francisco and the Bay Area is going to provide you the best possibilities for your hustle. You saw it when you were at, when you were at Startup Grind, that's, that's, I think, I, I think mean, we did the definition of hustle by doing a week worth of tourism in like 18 hours, man. You saw the snap. We did it all in one day. Yeah. Man. So there, see, we brought the hustle mentality there. No, but you're right. But no, definitely. let me, I've seen it for a long time. I mean, it, it takes a lot of hustle on an ongoing basis to do that Snapchat thing. That's kind of the ball. So, if you're going to, you mentioned stalking reporters. How many, uh, how many times have you been, uh, propositioned or how many people try to seduce you into writing about them and about I'm, their I'm going into my I the thing is like the, I invariably get asked that and you would think I would learn not to delete all the different pitches that I've gotten today but I, <laughs> you know there is there's so there's this one um, there's this one that I'm getting like I th there are many subtle varieties of the engagement that I've been willing to have with them and the engagement that I've not been willing to have with them one of them uh, works for, for Bleacher Report. And I've been wanting to do a story about Bleacher Report for a long time because they're in San Francisco and supposedly they've been able to maintain a good startup environment even though the company's gotten big now. And so one thing that if, if, if you want to turn it very briefly into a how to pitch properly, um, to a good extent, you want to pitch succinctly three or four ideas related to your company and why it could work. There's a lot of different ways that people uh, – a lot of different ways that people pitch me, but the one at Bleacher Report did a pretty good job. And she's from New York. They have an office in New York. They she came out here for the Super Bowl. I wanted to try and meet up with her. I just did, I just ended up being too busy and I couldn't meet with her um, and didn't follow up with her. Now she's re following up with me again, and she'll probably catch me at some point because it is about it is about Bleacher Report. But um, like she pitched me their no jerk hiring policy. Uh, they have more than it's like. She did like two or three sentences on that. Then she had a second one: how to maintain a startup vibe after being acquired by a media conglomerate. That's a that's a decent story. Could could be interesting. That's her second one. Her third one she sent me was Super Bowl digital marketing tips, and you know that was a Super Bowl specific one, so it, that doesn't really work now. But she's the one I I actually like. She followed up with me like so. She wrote the thing to me on January twenty sixth. She wrote a follow up January twenty eighth. Only two days later, and then I actually responded to her. And I actually said, yeah, that second story does look interesting. Let's try and meet for the Super Bowl this week. And then I got busy and then just didn't see her again. 
until like February 1st. So, or whatever. You, so is the secret to you really consistency on top of the, the actual relationship side, which I completely get where you're coming from too, but even if you have the relationship, it's just being consistent, not being one of those individuals one and done. Like, Oh, you didn't answer me. I guess no good. Go somewhere else type mindset. Yeah. I think that most people who pitch anything are going to have to recognize that most of the time what they pitch is, isn't going to work. You can increase your odds by knowing who you're pitching and knowing that it's right for them. But even then, like if you make your story that you're pitching them too similar to one that they've just done, that's actually hurting you because so that this is a, what a lot of people do. Hi, John. I just saw your story about XXX that you did on Inc. And I have a thing that's very similar. And I have a thing that you could do, to do on that as well. And that just makes me want to hit myself in the face. Because is that how you read the emails, by the way? Is, is, that, how you, is that how you read any That's the voice. That's, That's the voice. what their voice – their voice sounds like a combination of, like, the teacher in Charlie Brown who's all wah, 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 and one of – and Molly Park. Garrison <laughs> in South Park who's like, hey, I'm very happy, you know, like that. So anyway, that, so that's what their voice sounds like when I read that in my head as I'm reading it because I'm crazy. Anyway um, – <laughs> <laughs> We're so, this, is, this is so far been a great episode by the way i feel bad for those like audio only and not seeing your facial expressions when you do this. i know right i'm like in the dark here i need to like turn on some fucking lights in this joint come on you have no um, excuse man you're free I like, the, um, I like the ominous silhouette that's really actually pretty ominous cool silhouette. <laughs> um but no no seriously uh that is the reason why that doesn't work <laughs> is because I just did that story. Why would I now want to go like do this? So it is, it is interesting though you bring this up, which is I try to tell people all the time, especially their clients, you need to come up with a narrative. They're not gonna expect the media to come up with a narrative for you. Why in the world would they do that, right? They're so busy as is and they have so many other opportunities. So I, yeah, I think that there are certain uh, trending stories that if you go to tech meme every day, or if you just go to the fucking, New York Times every day, there are certain trending stories and there's always some story about tech. There's always multiple stories about that are related to tech that are going on in this technological society now. So um, it's okay to pitch me actual titles of possible stories. I think that this type of story could work. You know, that that's okay because it will, for me as a contributor, um, I'm able to actually come up with my own stories a lot of the time and, and sometimes those actually are, are helpful. You know? Follow up to my Follow up to my last question. How many of the stories that you're contributing are from people pitching to you versus you coming up with an idea and following through? On like that? a smaller percentage. Uh, mostly it's like five to 10%. Most of the, so basically what I did at, at, at some point, like a couple years back was I wrote down the main stories that I knew I wanted to be considered somewhat of an expert for. Um, uh, and, and also uh, that I was most interested in. And and so I basically wrote down those ideas and I basically kept on coming up with more ideas ad nauseum, ad infinitum. So, um, and those ones for me primarily include like marketing of all kinds online and, and successful e-commerce web, web, website stuff. And also some, like I'll, I can actually get on Fortune once or twice a month, so that's great. And they usually want something that's related to in, uh, investing in, in startups. I can get on uh, Intuit QuickBooks, the Intuit product. They have a blog that, that ranks really well, and I can get onto their site doing stuff that's about investment and, and, and VC stuff. And then there's uh, Business Insider. I can get onto them once or twice a month, usually about uh, something about how to be a better employee is what they're looking for from me. And then one time I got to interview Robert Herjavec, which was great. And they were like, oh, yeah, let's get that. So I basically made like three Robert Herjavec stories and did one on Inc., one on Entrepreneur, and one on Business Insider, different for each. And had to cut and just took different parts of the quotes that I got and then came up now, with a story. Now, everything you write, is there one topic you just love writing about? Like you're obsessed with almost like this is like my favorite. I just I can write about this all day type topic. Yeah, there's there's the whole San Francisco thing is definitely one of them, but I don't get to write about it often because most of the publications are wanting – uh, they're wanting like startup trend stuff, uh, how to be a better employee or a better manager. They're wanting uh, social media, online marketing. They're wanting stuff like that. And that's specifically more what they're looking for. But uh, the, my favorite story that I've done was when Facebook decided to, uh, I believe it's, they decided to give $10,000 to any employee who would move within, a, who would move closer to the campus in Menlo Park, near where startup crime was held. and. Um, and so, yeah, that the, the idea that, it, so number one, that got on entrepreneur and it got picked up like on several places, including SF gate, the San Francisco Chronicle, which me having born and raised in San Francisco, that was like a really cool thing. I got to actually be in SF gate for the first time in my life, which was awesome. 
So, and then it got like 200 comments. Like it got like three comments on Entrepreneur and the Entrepreneur's stories do very well and get a couple thousand shares. But that one on the Chronicle did fantastic and got 200 comments and people went all crazy about it. In the comments, especially those types of stories here in the Bay Area, so many people have so many opinions about, I mean, I, I even wrote, I even wrote a story at one point about how comment sections should be destroyed. However, some some blogs are fantastic and need those comment sections because people like they're almost like forums. People get so so you know uh, worked up emotionally about, so about things what? related. Most building should have no community. It's just content only. But those few that have a hub mm -hmm. maintain that hub type mindset. Right. I think I, the idea being like no comment section. Have them talk on 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 social media, your Facebook, your 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 even Twitter, that kind of thing, um, as opposed to having comments, which sometimes uh, are just like you know bump on a log. They just don't have like a like a fifth wheel. They just don't have a, a real use. So there's there are a lot of people who who think that that should be something that should happen. Is that you know get rid of it because it's like a whole lot of extra work sometimes to to manage that aspect. I have of things. learned or this though. Tell me your thoughts on this, but I've learned. I love writing content, not like I'm not doing media. I'm not that, but I'm writing just authentic content, like what we learn from running Chop Dog, the stories you hear from our clients. And the one thing I absolutely love is when someone leaves a comment and then getting involved in a conversation with them, using comments as another form of a conversation. Yeah. So you think if, if you're encouraging conversations, that's something you would, or you still say social media, all of it. There's, this should not be on the blog. This is now just a content source only. If I had to choose for me, I would say for me personally, I would say social media uh, only. However, I mean, if you really are seeing some kind of ROI from your comment section, and I know a lot of sites do. Um, but I, I would argue for every site that does, there's 20 that doesn't, right? I mean, even us, yeah. it took us maybe more. It took us so long before we actually started seeing activity on our blog, and it's still nowhere near where I would be satisfied right now. Like you're talking about it. I, I, I think I get more engagement now on Snapchat talking about blog posts than I do about the comment section itself. Snapchat, a place where the second they leave and I talk to them, it's gone forever, and it's only one on one. So that was a question. That was a question I was interested in asking you. How many comments with people saying things back to you per story occur? I at, for you, at, if I ask a question on Snapchat or like do something engaging that's encouraging people, my phone will blow up. I won't be able to get all of them. Like, and they all turn blue. And and I've actually learned recently if you get enough of them, Snapchat lags out and won't let you view older ones. Like it just it cuts you off. So certain people just I can't see them. So the answer is a lot, um, but it depends on content. Um, one of the things I have a lot of fun with recently is I'll tell someone to snap something or tell people in a story and seeing what's the percentage of people actually taking a screenshot on their phone. And that even has a higher conversion than the conversation piece. They give you perspective. Um, yeah. And I'm learning about that still too, because I think Snapchat is still relatively new on how to leverage it and make you the conversation piece. But here's the thing I think why people are attracted to it. And maybe you have thoughts on this. That one-on-one -on -one intimate conversation versus how social media, every other social network, you're talking to everyone. And though Twitter does have DMs, I know that's everyone's argument, most people don't answer DMs or most can't even DM because you need to be following each other, right? Unless you're verified. So Snapchat's that first platform where you can literally have that true authentic one-on-one -on -one in real-time conversation. What's the spamage like? Is there much spamage there? Like, I mean, Twitter's like, obviously, no, so here, spam. This is why I don't use Twitter's DMs whatsoever because it's complete horseshit to me. I get like 1,400 DMs a day of junk spam, you know, click here to go see the sexiest ladies alive DMs, all that stuff yeah. that happens, you know? But it's not spam. <laughs> maybe not for you. <laughs> yeah. When you click it, you get their bias. Like, this is great. It's exactly what I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> what I was um, What's it called? No, John, it's, I would say I do get spam every now and then, but it's very far and few between maybe one, twice a month. It's not like Twitter where I'm getting like 98% yeah. is DMs of spam. It's, it's, it's incredibly rare. Now I will get the terrible, Hey, do you know any investors connect me pitch? Or I might get the, Hey, can you build my app for free and give me, and I'll give you equity pitch. I'll get that a lot more. Um, and I think part of that's, a lot of early birds of Snapchat, like the real young wings in the entrepreneur scene, don't know how to properly communicate or understand how that works and doesn't work, um, which is it make, makes sense because I think Snapchat's aging up quickly too compared to other, mm -hmm. uh, other social networks. But engagement side, it's insane right now. I hear you. 
Right on. I'm like changing your mind. Like, yeah. shit, maybe I should put out 10 hours of content a day on Snapchat. Uh, it's pretty hard. <laughs> I, mean, I would say most of the friends that I have, I only have like 40 or 50 friends. I'm not on there, you know, whatever. But uh, much. But I'll, I'll like throw up two, three things. Well, I, saw your Mally. I saw a couple from Mally. That was cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was awful. I threw them up there. But it's, it's like you got you to gotta cover Instagram. I got to cover my traditional shit like Twitter and Facebook. And uh, yeah, fine. I'll throw in Snapchat now too. So it's you got to like – the big thing that I'm like, we talked earlier today, very briefly on Facebook, you're like, uh, you know, what are your long-term goals? And one of my long-term goals is to actually like be more, to have more peace and balance in life. And if you're going to have any peace and balance in life, then you, you can't let these things dominate your, your time. I mean, I think, I think, I firmly believe actually that, you know, at a certain stage in life, you are able to donate, you know, 10, 12, 14 hours of your day to all this shit. And, and, but eventually things have to balance out right the law of averages right if you if you have been watching uh uh the walking dead in the last couple of weeks they talked about the law of averages they've had a long period of time on the walking dead where things have gone oh so well for them so like uh now you know they're, they're kind of like uh what's gonna happen when's the next when you know the law of averages when the, when's the shitty thing gonna happen so i th anyway with regard you know applying that to life you got to have some kind of balance overall as you do this thing and like have as much time to recover sometimes as you have to as you as you have to go crazy so i think at a certain stage especially the younglings as you mentioned they are going crazy and they're like yeah i'll go out to say you know i'll go out to san francisco i'll go out to silicon valley and i i can overcome the the giant hurdles that are there i think the really appropriate analogy for it is 1849 when they found gold in the mountains and literally like any, you know, any able-bodied man or even woman like came to California and overnight made San Francisco like the, the ninth biggest city in the country. So like back in 1850, when San Francisco was like a five-year-old city, it was like the ninth biggest city in the country. So th that's what happens when you find gold in the rocks. So that, that basically in the last 10 years, they found gold in the rocks here and everyone's fucking come here. Only problem is prospectors have been in the fucking stream the whole time finding the gold and now it's all been leached out of the mountain mostly. So I, hey, anything's possible. The next Facebook could be on the way. The next Snapchat could be on the way, but, but um it's kind of right now these unicorns a lot of them don't really have a great like sound business fundamentals and so slowly but surely a lot of these companies are kind of laying off 17 percent here investors are, are not think, investing and, and that's there. one of the things i think that you see more and more every day like was it it just happened linkedin zenefits um I'm trying to think of the companies in like the last two weeks i can think of like that's insane that i can even start listing out multiple companies in a two-week time frame oh, yeah. laying off you know, Yahoo, I think Yahoo's doing it, or Marissa is going to get the boot any day now, you know. Um, but it's just, It'll be sold. They're going to be sold to either, like, a bunch of different companies. They could get sold to Comcast. They could get sold to the Mitt Romney place, uh, Bain Capital. They could get, like, to the, to, you know, like, whatever. They're going to get sold, and, and, and she, it's not really her and, fault. Like what, what, No, what, I agree. It's not Marissa's fault. Uh, it's, 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 the, it's the years and years and years of how they ran that company leading up to this moment and innovation everywhere else on the, on the web and in the world. So, But speaking of that, I think this is actually a really interesting topic for you to bring up. Do you think there's actually like a piece wrong in the Valley that causes, in the grand scheme of things, these long-term companies to start faltering long-term? Like Then again, you do have companies like Facebook who is clearly thriving, right? But they have this idea of like buying these undervalued properties or they're going to increase and then putting all their resources in. Like Instagram was a steal at a billion dollars and people at the time were outraged. I think Oculus is going to be the same thing, right? And then you have Google who's like investing in literally everything you can think of. Like you think it, Google's in it. Um, so do you think it's maybe just the, the great companies long term stay or is it actually just like the Valley's mentality might have a fundamental wrong with it of, you know, focusing on just raising money instead of actually making something profitable and generating revenue and focusing on employees long-term. Like what's your thoughts on it? Well, I mean, I think that, um, I don't know if there's necessarily anything fundamental at the heart of Silicon Valley that, that, uh, is wrong, that is causing any of the issues so much. I think, uh, you know, ultimately a company is going to be successful because it, 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 it has a, a product that satisfies a certain demand and that's really all there is at the end of the day. Right. So Facebook, was able to learn how to make um, a whole lot of money advertising to these people in an ecosystem that it created. Um, Google was able to learn how to, or figured out how to make a shit ton of money off of its search engine. And these are the things, these are the pillars, the found, and they created a foundation that allowed all this money to be made. 
And then that money, you, then you kind of switch to a different model where uh, it's it's imperative that you buy other companies in order to head them off at the pass so they can't defeat you or destroy you. You make them a part of yourself. And that just is like, that, that comes with the territory, right? So I don't think that, and that none of that was invented in Silicon Valley. So the, the original thing is create product, make a lot of money. Number one, that was invented by people a long time ago. Number two, buy up everybody else so that they don't destroy you and you can then morph into some other new monster, which is like essentially Mark Zuckerberg walking down the, 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 the aisle with like his, his drone slaves with <laughs> VR. Thing. You saw that picture last week, right? So that, yeah. that's what Facebook is morphing into. It's going to be some like social version of, of virtual reality or something. Um, so... No, I don't think that – to answer your question, I really don't think there's anything fundamental at the heart of Silicon Valley that, that, is, that is an issue. I think that actually the reason why I don't think that we are really going to see a massive pop or a bubble pop is because the bubble, if there was a bubble, has already kind of deflated itself naturally as an as a, uh, appropriate reaction to – companies that didn't have necessarily the most sound business fundamentals. And that's really what, that's and you, really and what think, all it is. And I think you're accurate there. I mean, I think it started maybe two, three years ago, starting a group on and then kind of trickling itself down. Cause you're seeing less IPOs than it has been in like what the last couple of years, you're seeing a lot less comp a lot more companies. I should say saying we want to be private longer. Like we, you know, like I think Uber is a great example. I mean, this is three, four years ago. I think Uber would have already IPO would months ago. You know, and Uber is saying, we're just going to keep raising in private money. We're going to stay private. We're just going to stay focused. So I, I, I actually I agree with you to an extent. I, if there is a bubble, this is the worst of what the bubble is going to do. But it's still showing, like, to people who's going to create a real business and be able to thrive with it. And then who's focused on the wrong priorities. And the long term, your foundation is weak. I also, and this is an interesting conversation, actually, had at Startup Grind. So as you, being someone that contributes to the media, creates content in this narrative, do you think the media plays a part with maybe why certain companies fail? And what I mean by that is, let me explain, by almost like glamifying the concept of like raising money, IPO and stuff like that, instead of placing on maybe profits, revenue, quarter reports, or do you think it's just bullshit It's people coming up with excuses or maybe just egos that's contributing to that? But I'm really curious from your perspective, what you think. You're talking about like a tapestry of things. Yeah, no, totally. There's a lot. Yeah, no, we know John. We know John has sunk at least three companies single-handedly. Yeah, John, killer. <laughs> right. <laughs> now, so I mean, look, journalists are going to write about, uh, like, take take a look at Sarah Lacey at Pando Daily. She's gonna she's gonna write about. She's got her Pando Daily is a startup. And like she has written kind of really openly about how it's a big fat struggle, even though she's equipped with all the best investors in Silicon Valley, like sitting right there near her that she knows oh so well from having interviewed him since the 90s or whatever. Even with all that, she it's still a big fat struggle and they've had to erect a paywall. They sometimes send out emails that, that uh, you know, like check out this big story with an incendiary headline and a line or two. And then it says unlocked. Oh, it's been unlocked. So I click on it and then I go to it. And the very first thing I see is, oh, give us the $50 if you want to see the rest of the story. I'm like, but it was unlocked, bitch. Anyway, <laughs> the, the, <laughs> I kind of went off on a tangent a little bit. But the, the point <laughs> is that these people are only going to write about stuff that's going to get you to click on it. That's going to get you, go, in her case, it's going to get you to go into there and like click on her advertisers and also like, uh, spend, you know, give them 20 bucks a month or 10 bucks a month or whatever it is so that she has, you know, however many thousand, excuse me, people doing that at the end of the month that you have enough money that pays for her staff in such a way that she can keep scaling it. And I don't know if she can really keep scaling it because it's whatever. So I, I think that, you know, that whole idea that the media is like, you know, able to destroy companies. Um, I mean, it's not. I would say that the vast majority of the time, I would say it's a safe bet that they're not doing it on purpose. They're doing what they're, they're doing, doing their to job. get people. the media's job. Get get well. Look, so one thing that happened in 2007 when I first started working at NBC Bay Area was we're really on the cusp as a as a web writer for their website, trying to get people to go to the site. Wait, that's marketing. That's not journalism, right? And so we were like really on the cusp of that back then. So like in 2007 when I first started writing. As a, as a web producer for their for their website. Like the job was to write a certain amount of stories per day. But then pretty quick in there, it was at that point they were starting to really get into this. They're like, we need to get more people to the site. We, we can see for, through 
whatever, Quantcast or whatever, we can see that ABC is doing better than us. We can see that Cron, the, the independent station is doing whatever. This one's doing, we need to get more page views. So then I set about making sure that our, our, our stories basically got put on the Drudge Report, got put on FARC, got, up, got put on DIG. Oh boy, and I had fun with DIG for like all the way until 2009 when Kevin Rose blew it up. <laughs> but uh, Overnight. But, <laughs> but um, and then there's, there's Reddit and there's StumbleUpon and there's like 57 bajillion other, other, other places to get your content. But that was not what I was hired for. I won an award for it. I was really appreciated for it. I used that to get a job at several other paid, paid places and get paid more and make a career uh, partially out of that. But um, that was never journalism. It's never been the job of, of, of like a journalist to go get the page views. No, like a journalist has always, always been like, what's happening in the world? I'm going to got to go cover it. I got to go to fucking Afghanistan and almost get blown up and cover this important thing. Um, now it's like, oh boy, we really have to cover everything that Trump says, because if we don't cover everything that Trump says, then somebody else will, and they'll get the page views and we won't. So we better cover everything that Trump says. We better cover everything that is incendiary and stupid and silly, and we'll get people clicking because all we care about is making enough money so that we don't lose our jobs, so that we make the shareholders really fucking happy, so that we, et cetera, et cetera so the billionaires can stay billionaires. And, and, and that's pretty so much So let it. me ask you now, you know, there's questions coming with this. The rise of clickbait over the last few years, and maybe the beginning of BuzzFeed creating yeah, what is now. Man. Yeah, so let's hear your, a, your opinion on it, and then be more going back to this. Like, have you now become one of those clickbaiters because of the nature of the game? Or sometimes, sometimes. I love your answer already. So I just really want to hear your true <laughs> opinion. I know one guy who shall remain nameless, and man, this guy is a fucking genius. He's a genius. He sits in his backyard with his five dogs smoking cigarettes and some other things and you know and drinking and he can come up with like 40 the 40, 40 young entrepreneurs who are millionaires by the time they were 21 like he like he will come up with these lines that the, these these headlines that are just golden and like so for a certain publication that he might write for he will come up with these stories and he'll write these stories and they will get on the publication and they i mean they are just wonderful clickbait headlines and the particular publication will pay you, uh, uh, what is it, 10 bucks for every thousand uh, US page views, right? Well, he'll, he, I mean, he'll get 300,000 US page views in one month. And so he's, you know, you do the math. He's, and that's on one of the stories. So at the end of the day, you can have a life where you come up with, depending on the publication, seven or eight of these stories, and you're making more than 99% than of the humans in the United States. And, He's sitting in his backyard and he's he's you know doing that. So that but now that is an extremely uh, rare case. But that says all you need to know about the power of some of clickbait headlines. Now, what about so, you personally? Are you bought into it? Like I'm all about. I want as much. You know, going back to the signal, building that signal out by using this mentality, or you're like I want to do it authentic way. I view for me, I view it as like a, a slice of pizza. It's one of the slices of pizza, right? So it's uh, it's one of the, that type of story is one or two or three of the slices of pizza. For my friend, it's you know like half his pizza or whatever. He has a lot of other stories that he's covering too because of his connections, and he writes about a lot of he writes a lot about recruiting. He, he has other you know the, the the sources that he has and the stuff that he's interested in is different. However, he's pretty good about having these stories that have increased his following. Really, though. It's tougher to build a following for yourself, although you can do it, and it's easier to continue to build the following for the publication that you're with because their their name's much shorter than yours and easier to look up and, and all those things. And they have a huge you know account on Twitter or Facebook with a million followers. And so um, that's the thing that over time has been really helpful is getting those tweets from, from a publication like that because it does constantly put you out there more and more and they are basically – you're giving them page views and they're agreeing to help build your brand for you and your audience for you. you it's know? interesting you bring this up. So I believe the game has changed, right? And there's definitely just the game has changed and you got to play now the new, the new, the new, you know, the new roles of, or you're going to almost die. But I do see something like this. So this is always, this is more a true opinion. There's no facts backing this up. It's just my belief. 
is that you know in the 1800s, 1900s, you have to you have the kids screaming those catchy ass headlines to get someone to buy a newspaper for a nickel, right? Um, and or just hey, murder, whatever, something like the equivalent of what is clickbait today. And then publications realize, what if we create an authentic source of quality so we don't have to win them over and it gets a more subscription model, aka Pando, things like that. And I almost see. And Vox is actually probably a terrible example now because I used to think The Verge for the longest time did great content. In the last few years, I've seen them go down the clickbait hole. Their content's decreased. They've lost a lot of great people. They're still good, but they're no longer great, which is upsetting to me because they were at one point great. But I, um, I, I think that over time, we're going to see that again. It's kind of like everything's always in cycles. Same thing with entrepreneurship, with creatives, with videos, everything you know, a fashion that I believe over time, you're going to have again, that we're going to focus on quality and people are going to buy into the quality ecosystem because they want a trustworthy source, or maybe it's going to be individual. So like a great example is Ryan holiday. I think now he's not writing like journalist stories, but he's writing more just true content. He's wrote books. Like, trust me, I'm lying, stuff like that. So I'm curious, you, what is your take on like, you're looking at a long haul, right? You're in this for for as long as you can probably ha be able to type with a keyboard, which is probably your entire life, right? Just being real. Obviously, I'm talking about work-life balance over time. You know, who knows where priorities might switch. Where do you see this all playing out on the media side? Maybe just content creation side, right? Uh, just anything with content using words. It's really hard to know um, exactly what that's going to look like, and I don't have all the answers with that one. I will say, with me, I've always been a writer. I've been a writer since fucking uh god like grammar school like i've always loved writing it's always been what i'm what i'm good for whatever reason i was just born with that thing like i, I love writing and um always have so that'll always be a part of what i do in in some form whether it's like writing books or whether it's doing blog posts or whether, whether it's my own blog or you know whether it's writing for other people or it's telling people how to do it better or what i really like is editing other people's stuff when i get a chance to do that which isn't that often um, because it's always it's always good to clean up people's work uh, when they're not quite as polished as you, and you're able to sort of polish oh, it up. Oh man, if you saw mine, you would just erase all my content just right from scratch. If you saw mine, and he's nodding his head right ah, now. It's so bad. Much I'm, it, I'm the in-house editor here. Yeah, I, I was gonna say like if 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 you have to deal with that, then the person's not ready to write at Publication X yet. So like, well, see, I'm, I, I'm probably, never gonna write at a Publication. So let's be real here. <laughs> I'll be writing. Well, number one, your your writing's probably just fine, um, and it's better than you're saying it is. But oh, um, I, I but definitely yeah. am harsher than probably most people are reading it. Let's be real. And I, I use a lot of services. Like I go for, I download this extension on Chrome called Grammarly or something like that. Then Eddie will proofread it. Yeah. Then I'll send it to Fiverr and I pay someone five bucks to proofread it more. And then I'll wait till someone leaves a comment and says, "Josh, why the fuck does it say this?" And I'll edit it. Like, what are you talking about? So you know, I go through like multiple rounds of revisions leading up to what is that final product. So yeah, for sure. But yeah, anyways. Have you guys, have you guys um, so whatever is going to happen, it's going to happen on, on a mobile device. Whatever is going to happen, oh. it's going to happen on a mobile device. Because it's not even healthy to be sitting in these fucking chairs. So and like, it, like sitting in the chairs is, is not healthy, right? So like for long periods of time, because evolutionary wise, human body is not meant to sit in a fucking chair that didn't exist until like 2,000 years ago or 5,000 years ago. But but us in the form that we've existed scientists say we've existed like uh several hundred thousand years even so the vast majority of the time that we've been a biological form on this planet we have not been sitting down so it's just not healthy so um definitely you know standing desks are great but it's more like you're not snapchatting at your at your desk i mean sometimes you do but 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 um mostly you're walking around and doing shit so right, news that's also pretty boring right because that's another reason like if i snap here all day it's you're gonna be sick and tired of me real quick. Exactly. I mean, half the things that make the snap the snap interesting are like the little animations that you put in there, and the fact that you're on the beach, and then there's the Golden Gate Bridge in the background. You know, so it's like the fact you're walking around and doing stuff and saying stuff, and then you get cut off, and then you immediately freaking continue, and then you keep doing it. But anyway, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but uh, was I say? Oh, so whatever's gonna happen, it's gonna be on this, right? And so it's going to be in different forms, but one of the main, so one of the main forms that you're going to see is like, have you downloaded the Quartz at, app yet? You know, Quartz QZ.com, the Quartz news site. It's pretty good. I, I had that a while ago, but I deleted it like maybe six months ago. Is it better now? Is it new? Refresh? All it is is, so it opens, it's like this, 
queue, right, for courts. It's going to take a second to open. And it's AI run. It's, in a t it's a text. You text it. It texts you the news. And it's run like, like an AI. Like, so basically, um, it's a little text conversation. So it's going to say something to me in the bottom. Said, okay, so it just starts right away at the very bottom right there. It's backwards, but it says one of Google's self-driving cars is partly to blame for a recent fender bender in California. I can do one of two things at, at, at the bottom there. I can either pick what happened or anything else. So I'll pick what happened, and then it'll it'll send the next thing right there. It's typing it. It sent it. The car hit a public bus at low speed when it tried to change lanes. A person was inside the car but was not driving it. So I can now do two things at the bottom. I can do, so was it the car's fault? Um, or I can say anything else, any other stories. I'm going to say, so was it the car's fault? And then it'll finish up the story with one. It never goes past three paragraphs, and it gave me a big old paragraph right here. So it says, uh, actually, it, made, it gave me two paragraphs. It sometimes go to four paragraphs. So, right, so like just it, short bursts of information, when you want it, where you want it, how you want it type mindset. It's like your friend is telling you the news, but they're actually like you can cite them because they're an actual news source. And this is a way that people are going to be getting news. Like it's a way that they're going to be getting it may, I'm not saying it's going to be the most popular way, but it definitely, there's no sharing this on Facebook. There's no sharing, and you know, that it kind of like, I think people don't really have time for that. It's like an extra thing. I think people are getting tired of the idea that they would or should have to share something, even though like so many of us depend on that. So many publications depend on that. And so many people like are looking through their Twitter streams for that and things like that. And so many of us want to try and get our content out there using those methods. And I'm not necessarily saying that that will, that will even shrink. Like the, the shrink sharing will somehow, I'm not saying that, especially when you know, there's a hundred million people using smartphones in the US and they're like shopping on the phones now and buying most of their shit on the phones now. But let's forget about the United States. Let's go to China where there are 600 million people doing it. Okay, so if you have 600, that's pretty much a microcosm of the re of where humanity is going. And because um, it's like 10 percent of all humans are shit, one sixth of all humans are Chinese and then one sixth of all humans are Indian. If you draw a circle around India and China like that, there are more people living in the circle than there are living outside of the circle. But um, or so I've been told somewhere. But <laughs> quoting real <laughs> sources here, man. This is all yeah, no, it, it, that it, it, it has an air of truthiness, like that whole Stephen Colbert truthiness thing. But um, so yeah, good. an app. Yeah, no, it's it's true. Seriously, like there there is a. You know, no, I do. Has I know you're being very accurate here. It's just making fun of you, John, as I normally do. <laughs> but uh, so that's where we'll probably get the, the news from. A lot of us, you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh. That's where we'll probably get the news, a lot of us. So who writes that news? It's written by a fucking computer. So you asked me a while ago, where do I see all this going? Well, definitely a huge portion of it is AI taking control over, over some of these things. So, You know, it's crazy, but it's, it's, it's like at Startup Grind. So one of the people we got to see speak to us is Slack, the, the founder of mm -hmm. Slack and Flickr. And he was mentioning that AI is quickly is already almost taken over the amount of messages on Slack versus real people. And that people are using Slack to remind themselves, which is what I do all the time. Um, send them when they get a tweet, when they get an email with live chat, like, and he believes that Slack one day is, even though it's a primary communication tool, it's going to be almost like, I forget what he put percentage wise that he maybe correct me if you remember, but some staggering, like 89% of all Slack's activity for you personally is automated and catered to you and having an artificial intelligence that just, knows you it makes you more optimized and it's interesting that you well, bring this up with the media because it can be your entire life every aspect's being modernized around you like your smartphone learns your habits and gives you your info it's already doing it with google right it tells you how long to get to where you need to go with traffic reminds you if you need to pick something up you know it tells you the holidays if you have tickets like google inbox will say hey don't forget you have a flight your inbox etc right that's the entire what's happening to us as a society now well i think i, I really you know if you haven't seen the movie Her, you guys have seen the movie Her? <laughs> seen the movie Her, yeah. No, I mean, that pretty much tells you where a lot of it's going right there, essentially. And that's like within potentially even like 10 years right now where you – like, look, one of the biggest problems that humans face these days is loneliness. And, that, and, and there's just no denying that. And we, we do a lot of the things that we do out of loneliness. Well, there's going to be a desire to not be lonely, and that could quite possibly be uh, – a product that some company, probably Google provides or, or Facebook provides, um, making it so that you can be pretty intimately connected to somebody who's in Arkansas 
or uh, like Scarlett Johansson, only in uh, computer form. There's another good show. Um, seriously, there's another. Good <laughs> I just show. imagine Scarlett Johansson actually, like, from her, is that actually a tangible product? Like, you could just have her as a friend. Well, there was an oh, episode of the show. You seen of Black Mirror? Mirror? Yeah, Black Mirror. See, my okay. man. So Black Mirror, <laughs> right, is basically a modern Twilight Zone. Like it's like one of the best shows on TV and it's on Hulu. So it's not even on TV, whatever. Um, but yeah, so you know the story, Eddie. Do you want to say what the deal is with that? Well, I think or, that started out as kind of the same concept of her, right? They were, the girl was like talking to, uh, she was exchanging emails with her deceased husband and it was, the system was learning about her. And then eventually they created some kind of robot. Josh, you've seen the show, right? You've seen yeah, I'm going to want to introduce you to the show. Let's be real here. Are I you definitely though? did. Or you might, you might, you might. I have definitely been. introduced you to Black Mirror. Let's be real. No, it was actually that was probably one of the weaker <laughs> episodes. To be honest with you guys, that we're talking. What? about. I love that episode. I thought it was really. really? I thought it was one of the weaker ones. Uh, I thought I, I well, whatever. It you know that's that's a personal opinion, right? Yeah, no, you're but, right. Uh, it is. It is. Yeah. Not like it's not like any of us are Siskel or Ebert or any of that, but whatever. No, I mean, it's it's on. What? I mean, so speak for yourself here, John. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> well, anyway, so bottom line is, uh, lady has a husband. They they're great. He dies somehow. I'm all spoilers right now. He dies somehow, like a car accident. Who cares? Anyway, she's you know, oh, woe is me. Everything sucks now in my life. And now she's she's you know, she's she, uh, that service. Some, yeah, that service that like yeah. copies your Facebook and turns you into a email like IM service. And it's true. Like we're putting so much of ourselves on the internet that we could create mm -hmm. a clone of ourselves based on the inf information we give them, which is scary because not everybody is. I, let's say like nobody is truthful about who they are on the internet, right? People are always exaggerating or embellishing or or whatever. It's like the it's the ideal version. So the real of answer is to go through your internet browsing history. That unless you're self, unless you're like a self-loathing person, that's probably like a really really shitty version of yourself. I don't know about you guys. I'm ready for um. I'm ready for a Josh Overlord, the AI version of me. Right. I, I don't think I could handle. I don't think I could handle the version of Josh that is on the internet versus the one that I know. So he'll be way too enthusiastic and, and supportive. Uh, yeah, and like it, it, I can totally see that being a thing. So there are some people who are so narcissistic in the world and who love themselves so much that I can totally see that being probably like one or two percent of all humans to who create their own private Scarlett Johansson who lives and is the person they live with would be them. They would be so happy. <laughs> I swear, like, there's narcissistic. Kanye, Kanye West would have. Yeah, Kanye, Kanye would be West just him in AI form. Oh, yeah. There's no doubt. About it. Yeah, yeah. He, you know, you know the comment that some people make. They're like, if only I could clone me, then I could get all the shit done that I want to get done, right? So I think that that could be perfect for some of those people who want to do that. Um, if I, I could I, hire myself as a secretary, that'd be a terrible idea because I'm not organized at all. So I need <laughs> someone else to be organized for me. You can actually buy <laughs> AI or you can clone yourself. Or you can, like how 2020 works, Eddie. You can like put your AI out there. If someone wants to buy it, you'll get money from it. <laughs> it's you create yeah. a marketplace of AI. Um, you know, it's actually interesting. You know, so talking about this, the actual content put out there, I would say is 5% of my actual identity. Like even though I put so much content out there, I'm for the most part actually very private. Um, even though social media doesn't communicate that, you know, like you're not seeing intimate moments with me and my girlfriend or like when I'm watching movies on the couch or when I'm not working like the, the trans obsession with tentacle porn. Yeah, exactly. With that, you know, because that's a thing. Um, no, but seriously, it's like the, the, the vision you see of me online is curated by me for the purpose of my brand, what I want people to think when they think of me, the content I want them to have. Like, I'm sure that's for everyone, though. Right. You know, and it's almost going back to depression here. That fear of missing out, that FOMO, is I think a real cause of depression to stay in age. And the, real <laughs> the reality here is you're only seeing people's like best moments online. You're not seeing the true authentic versions of them. You're seeing like, you know, my top moments of my life in digital form. You know, so I also feel like, you know, if we're going into this conversation here, that's a real thing. Totally. Yeah. I mean, most people, let's be really honest, um, not to not trying to say it's bad or good. I'm just saying, but like most of us, our lives are pretty much mostly like empty moments. Like, why you, you know you're thinking about stuff or whatever, but you're watching TV or or you know you're just chilling or you're working or you're whatever. You're sleeping eight hours, seven hours, six hours of the day. So a lot of what you're doing is just like, like you said, not not fit for pub fit for public consumption because it's not like my best greatest hits volume two, you know. 
So I am curious. We're talking about <laughs> amount of sleep. Walk us through what is like an average day for you, like the average day. I'm not talking about when you go to Maui, like just say when you wake up to go to sleep type of day, what are you doing? Like how much is work life? Like what are you focused on? Like that type of thing. Yeah. I mean, I would say an average day is wake up at 8, 15, 8, 30. I should, you know, there's things that you, I, I would like to change some things about it, but the way it stands right now is wake up at around then. Um, wake up, take like at least a half an hour to not look at a screen. Like that is, that is like a number one goal for me right now is to not look at a screen for at least the first half of an hour every day. When did you that, start doing that? Cause I've been feeling that lately. I, I like just been um, feeling like, my day is starting. I need to do something that's not involving my laptop or my phone right now for a minute. I think that that is, that's so key. I think that's like, it's just a huge deal um, for me anyway. Um, I've been doing it for about a year, uh, but it was starting to bleed into my life before then because what I was noticing was if you get up in the morning and the first thing you do is that, like I went... <laughs> Like the, 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 the first thing that you do is look at the phone and get right into it when your brain is still like all soupy and not working well yet, it's going to decrease your effectiveness throughout the day. And you're going to, you're going to more easily be emotionally upset, make the wrong decisions. You are uh, right about it. I can't tell you how many times I've seen an email in the morning and my first reactions, I need to go in my boxers upstairs and answer that email now. It's emotionally throwing me off for the day. You know, you're, you're right. It's, it, it's almost, I actually try to like, I try is a key word, like just getting a routine. Like I just like to jump in the shower first thing and I wake up and almost like just a moment to myself, the, almost like turning on, booting up yourself, almost like a meditative state. All right. That just to me is the most effective way of me starting my day. It doesn't happen very much. In fact, I almost argue it doesn't never happens, but that's the most effective way that I'm self-aware enough to know is right for me. Hawaii was interesting because uh, I, I ended up like living with two different dudes. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, but what, but no, not in a, not, you know, in a work way. So anyway, the first one, first one was in the hotel is a buddy of mine for a long time. Sometimes a colleague, coworker, a fellow writer for a different publication. He, me and him bunked in the same bungalow. It was fucking awesome. Is it this old, but nice Hawaiian resort called the Royal Lahaina? Anyway, so we're in this bungalow. His deal is he's taking a bunch of meds. And like, cause he has like depression and shit like that. So he's taking a bunch of meds. So he's sleeping a lot, right? He's like hella chill. He's watching Trump be an idiot on the screen. Me and him just like fucking make fun of Trump all day. That's, you know, and, and then like, also we're watching, uh, we're watching like different movies and shit and just having a good time and then drinking and, and, and partying, whatever. It's good. Um, so that was great. He was much more like, I'm not going to look at the screen until like, I, you know, I'm going to go to, I'm going to go to the gym. Um, but then I'll then I'll look at the screen. So that bring it back to the subject at hand. He was more laid back. Then the last two days, my buddy from San Francisco, Mister Startup Guy, fucking comes into town because he's going to speak at the conference too, and he arrived too late for that anyway because he runs around like a chicken with his head cut off. First thing he does every morning is, you know, every time I see him, he's in line to get a scone. Like you know, like that's what his life is. This fucking thing. And that's it's like, God. no, I mean, that's miserable. No, I mean, look, that's that's me. I'm not even going to lie to you. And I know it's a problem. That's the issue. It's like, you're right. It, it, I remember we were on the train back in Philly. We were on the train back and his phone died. <laughs> he still just like out of habit would pick up his dead phone and try to look at it. And I'm like, dude, your phone's dead. <laughs> and, and that's when I went on Amazon and bought a self charger that I can bring with me on the road. <laughs> <laughs> that's how it all happened. Look, I will say that. For me, I have noticed that, um, you know, a pendulum swings this way, it's going to swing back this way, right? So if you spend all your time looking at the phone, 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 you can look at the phone all you want, but eventually you're going to have to fucking put it down or you're going to like... No, so, all right. So real talk here, and then we'll go back to your average day because we didn't even get past 8.15 in the morning so far. Oh, yeah. um, I actually have an email problem, and this is something I've been fully open with, aware, and it bothers the fuck out of me. Is that why well, I it will no, it was just Mac mail. Unfortunately, I'm on Mac mail because of Gmail. Is Mac mail is Mac mail good at getting rid of the spam? It's all right. It's got better, but it still sucks Gmail's ass. Google, no, I want Google. The, the best. So I want Google Inbox because it's great UI, great effective, but it's not open yet to using third party email. So when it does, that's when, immediately the day to open it. Yeah, but you can still it. No, you can. You can. No, you can I thought it. I thought Google can, Inbox. I do it. I do it. You know, you, no, like you, you can do it. You have, a, you have a Gmail email that you're having it all forward to. I want my real email 
in Google Inbox. I want to feed all of that in there. Okay. So I don't want to wait. I want it when Google Inbox opens it up as just a mail client, which they will. They've been open. But anyways, here's the problem. Even with this, it's still going to be a problem, which is I'm way too dependent on email with communication. I will get emails and I'll immediately, whatever I'm doing, I'll immediately set my focus, see what that message is. It will completely change my emotional state based off the nature of the email. For example, today, not going full detail, we're in the middle of contract talks with a, with a client of ours, right? Or a potential client of ours. And depending on that, it completely changes my state of mind from being happy and go lucky to pissed off and miserable from the one email. And I'll take so much time writing drafts and then going back and forth and editing it. It's, you no, know, Eddie even said it. We, we way complicated something, which is a one fucking sentence email. Right. And I'm aware mm-hmm. about this and, I, and I'm getting better at it to an extent. Like, for example, well, that's the first step. well see, I you're aware. With, oh, I've been aware for a while, though. So this might be a first step, but I've been aware. You know, I've done some things that will come at it. Right. I'll schedule emails, even if I write it right away, to send like eight hours from now, just because then it's not giving the other person the habit of, oh, he's right here. I'm going to ping him back right away. Things like that. But it, it's still right. I, I don't know what the mantra is. It's just that immediate response culture I know I want. And at the end of the day, I know it. if I email you tomorrow when you send me an email today, nine times out of 10, you're not going to give a shit because if it's something serious, you're calling me anyway, or you're sending me a text. You're not emailing me, you know? So, but it is a problem. I think email and more messaging in particular. Now, social network's different because I could care less about social media. I love it. And I love giving out content, but I don't feel like I'm obligated to respond back. But when it comes to email or text messaging to people I know or work with, I feel like if I'm not immediately getting back, I am not delivering my full potential. And that's the fucking wrong way to approach it. But it's really, really hard to break out that habit when you're in that habit. And it's literally part addiction. I know that for a fact. And part just your mindset that I got to somehow change. So it is a problem that, you know, and it comes back to why you're saying I'm always checking the phone. I'm always checking my phone to look at my emails or check on Slack or just see, you know, make sure I haven't missed anything important going on here. And that's not healthy. It's not whatsoever. And it's something I'm trying to get a kick out of. Well, yeah, I think it's a long-term project. So you're, you're describing, again, it, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated thing involving many different levels. It's a tapestry of stuff. Um, one of the key things that, and you'll notice that you do have a lot of the answers just sitting right there that you know already. You intellectually know them. But what has happened in your life is the costs of not having done these things right has not been high enough yet for you to really change your ways. Yes. So, 100%. so that's really all it comes down to. No, you're right. So and, and, yeah. And I think the issue is what happens. There is, the the day, that's right there. We, he, let me say this. Human beings are very reactive uh uh, uh, entities, right? Like we're, we're very reactive. We think that we're doing all these things based on these calculated decisions that we, we, we're not really. A lot of times we're doing it, like you said, because of emotional states that come about because of perceived meaning and res- like, you know, like, oh, this thing was said by her or him and they said it and oh, now therefore I am now in bad mood. Like that's that's not a decision. That's like a reaction. So what I'm saying is most of the time human beings immediately do that we are very most of the time i'll repeat it most of the time all human beings are usually doing that so in in almost everything we are we are very given to emotionally responding to things that we see emotional reactive we make meaning out of all this different stuff we're always walking around saying is this right or is this wrong can i trust this or should i distrust this is he full of bullshit or is he not is do I want to do it or do I want to not do it? Like we're always thinking that's the it's a monkey mind. It's a sea of thoughts that, that we're always in. So I could go on and on and on, but um, obviously, but um, what, what were we talking about? We're talking about your morning routine. It's interesting because we've almost brought it full circle. We, talked it. we were talking about how, you know, you start to become aware of these things and you start to work at them and yeah. you start to spend less time worrying about certain things. And that's kind of like we were talking about earlier. Like the younger, the younger people that come into the industry and into, let's just say, the startup scene in general, and and uh, specifically, they're putting fourteen to sixteen hours a day into what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, those same people aren't putting more time or less time into what they're doing. Fifteen years in, they're just understanding how to do it more I, I efficiently, mean, right? That's yeah, what we're so all this is a great example. Going back to work-life balance, 
Or they're in a different situation at that point where they don't need to do the 14, 16 hours. They've seen the error well, of their ways. When you're younger, you have a, you have a body that can handle that abuse. No, you're right. And that's I, what it is. Also, when you have, no, you're right. What you need, you need to rely on that ability because you don't have the ability to do it efficiently yet. Like, you, you just don't know how. Yeah, extent, that's certain. Yeah. No, to an extent, I agree. That, but I mean, like, even right now, I think I have more awareness than I ever did five years ago of my work life balance. You know, I know now, for example, Eddie, I'm willing to bet you three, four years ago, we did the trip we just did. We're not even spending Sunday just enjoying it. We're working. We probably don't even leave that Airbnb the entire time, right? Or if we are, we're going to a coffee house to work because Airbnb didn't exist four or five years ago. Um, you know, like that's pretty much it. And, you know, more time spending now, like spending evenings, I'm just turning everything off. I'm going to go watch a movie or I'm going to go to a sporting event and not worry about work. That's definitely something I've done differently since we started working together. I haven't I, before when we first started working together. I didn't take days off. I like I would every now and then take a few hours here and there with friends, but I didn't take like a, a Saturday off or a Sunday off or or even like a mid of the, middle of the week like break. Was, but that now I do that. So now we had when I was your yeah go first. I was just gonna say I was just gonna say when I was your guys' age, I did the exact same thing. Not like oh I'm so mad, but I am forty one now, right? So like and you guys are what like mid twenties, early twenties. Or 26, or what are you guys? 23 a year. Yeah. I'm 20. 23. 23. When I was around that age, like I, I did that too. Only I was working for a TV station. I had it in my mind I was going to be a TV reporter, and I did become that. And I actually ended up leaving that because it just didn't pay enough, and a bunch of other things ended up happening. But um, so I, I was pretty successful, and I did a lot of like six day work weeks, a lot of 10, 11 hour days. Uh, and I would feel fine the next day. I'd also party like a rock star and like drink like crazy and, and, and smoke or whatever. And then like wake up the next day and just go at it and do it again. I can't do that anymore. Like, like as you get older, the amount that you can do that just nat naturally goes down. And you'll notice, even if you're 23, Josh, you're going to, you, by the time you're 25, you're going to, dude, I just had, the, um, I don't drink often. I just had a two day hangover for the first time in my life. And that was the worst, not one, but yeah. two. <laughs> one, thing, one thing is, is, you know, it's, Drinking is like running. It's like staying in shape. <laughs> if you don't keep doing it, then you start to lose the ability <laughs> to do it well. Seriously, like if you want to be a marathon runner, you have to run. If you really want to be long a binge drinker, you got to binge drink every night. You got to binge drink every night, and you want to be an alcoholic. Well, then your liver will like be highly efficient at it at getting rid of that poison, right? But it will eventually, you know, after. Yeah. Getting punched enough times it will eventually die or you know people I, I had a friend who died at like the age of 45 off of off of liver disease so like but he really partied hard the whole entire time he was alive so livers can handle that stuff but you know at a certain point they're like okay fuck you bye so but uh the same goes with with working a lot of hours you know i mean if you work a lot of hours a lot of the time and you you know optimize yourself to do that you can do that pretty well but if you want to try and have more of a life and do other things that you might enjoy inevitably those things are going to come in and it's not going to be easy for you to continue to maintain that you're going to have want to have kids you want to get, get you want to be with a girl you're going to want to get married you want to do all yeah. that so so i mean i uh, there you go yeah, that's, that's wanted, one thing i've been learning is everything's about balance and you know someone yeah. i really look up to and i'm personally friends with um his name's uh, Makesh patel if you Google him, he's a very influential entrepreneur, family, awesome guy. Um, well, yeah, nice, Josh. Um, for those in Blab, you can read that comment. Uh, <laughs> and I started sitting saying. on them on accident. So, <laughs> uh, one of the things he said to me when I first met him was, you know, what we're doing is a marathon. It's not a sprint. And when you're young, you think it's a sprint. It's the same people who make that rookie mis mistake in a marathon by sprinting right at the get-go and then being burned out and dying in the middle of it. You know, and the idea is like, and CZ even told me, he didn't even get into the game that I've been doing since I was 16 until he was 27. And he didn't make a name for himself until his late 30s, almost 40. He's like, dude, you already have like a 10-year head start on me. And, you know, you were where I was like in my 30s. You can take it time and still surpass even where I am as long as you keep learning and do it right. But he's like, you know, I learned a little too late in my opinion that work-life balance, the relationship, he's, he corrected it now. You know, he focuses on his health. He has, you know, he, he's with his wife. He has kids now. He travels a lot more. But, you know, he, he was like, I live by Bill Gates' quote about in his 20s, he's never took a day off in his life. And he's like, it's the one thing he hated Bill Gates the most was ever coming up with that quote. You know, that was like the thing he brought up to me. And he says the one thing that pisses him off is, you see, I'm not going to call names out there in the space, but we all know a couple key people who preach about, 
I'm going to outwork you every second of the day. And you're a fucking scumbag because you're causing the burnout culture and you're causing what could be the most talented people to actually peak too early because you burned them out. And I actually wrote a um, article for a blog. I haven't posted yet just about this. Um, yeah. Because you know, I, I, cause I think it's a subject matter. And here's the thing. It's not sexy though. Yes. Entire ongoing series of posts going on forever about this. I mean, just the whole topic of whether or not the work-life balance is a proper you is a proper phrase. Like I had this one woman who got so mad at me uh, some months back for calling it work-life balance. She's like, "Well, you know, work is part of your life. It's not aside from your life or apart from your life. It's part of your life. So, you know, you shouldn't be calling it work-life balance. You should just be calling it life balance." And I'm like, "You should just go fuck yourself." I mean, it's like. It doesn't matter if you're if she's right or wrong. It's like, look, we all know what you're trying to get at. Don't like parse. No, I mean, listen, but, um, I love what I do. There is no doubt about it. I don't see myself doing anything else, and it and it it fuels me too. Like if I wasn't passionate mm -hmm. about this, I would be burned out long ago. But I love it, and it is my oxygen, as people would say. But you know, at the same point in time, like any aircraft, you don't see LeBron James literally playing basketball twenty four seven. He would fucking hate it. So you got to figure out, you know, other passions, other things you enjoy. And it can be some more vertical. And him don't look happy. So there's something wrong there. But yeah. Just saying. So, so anyways, <laughs> back to morning Sorry. routine. <laughs> it's 8 15 a.m. Um, you wake up. I want to talk more about like what is wrong with, with Cleveland. How come they don't look happy? Like, <laughs> what, this what has you been one of the that? greatest podcast episodes yet. What I've been done. This is <laughs> I'm serious though. You know, like I, I mean, I love LeBron. He's like, he's like he's a human freight train. Like he, I when he came into Miami, they were great. Um, and I don't know, uh, precursor. I'm a Miami yeah, fan. Yeah, yeah. I've been a Miami fan for a long. Yeah. Time. Uh, LeBron came. Everybody was happy. We were all happy. And then there were some conversations about uh, Spo about Eric Spolstra being a problem too. Like every coach he he plays with. Uh, he's he clashes with. I don't know what it is. Like he's uncoachable. I, I don't know. I, I well, I definitely think that when you're that amazing of a player, um, you, you got Kobe Bryant syndrome, kind of like nobody, no one, no one can really coach you. Like I think that one of the one of the things about one of the one of the traits about any human being that I would like the most would be that to some degree they are coachable, and that goes to me as well. Like if somebody cares about me enough to tells me tell me some things that I'm doing wrong, then I had better at least consider it and think about it. Right. And so I think that, yeah, I think that with Co with uh, yeah, Kobe too, but that's a, that's, that's water under the bridge, but with now, now currently LeBron, like I think that there is an issue there and essentially he's like a player manager almost only he's not a good manager, but he's, he's like the best. Player. Exactly. So, I don't think that works very well in a, in a team sport. I mean, I think the same thing with Melo and the Knicks, right? I mean, Melo is the face of that franchise and they're not doing anything worth mentioning i mean and sodomire actually talked about it like yesterday he said that when he went to uh the knicks that they felt like they had brought like it was a resurgence and they felt like they brought life back into new york city basketball and um then Melo came over and became the, fr the face of that franchise and it was like kind of downhill and, yeah. and the whole the whole like, synergy like all that was all messed up and i think that just as a team sport that's why you have teams like the spurs like killing it like every year yeah with like the last 15 years they've had 50 wins every season I mean, that's just... They're insane. It's because they play no such fundamental, like, teams. It's tough being basketball. a Sixers fan, you guys. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, baby. <laughs> <laughs> it is. I mean, I, 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 1980 was a good year. <laughs> 1980 was a great year for Philadelphia. Every team made it to their finals. Eagles went to the Super Bowl. Phillies went to the World Series. The Sixers went to the NBA Finals. And the Flyers went to the Stanley Cup Finals. Only one team won, but... Hey, whatever, you know. You take it however you can get it. So, Those all right. Types of things. Yeah, but will we want to get back to my day? Yeah, Is that what you want to do? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We've gone all the way out there. Let's bring it back. Yeah, I actually got it. <laughs> I got to wrap this up soon. I got some stuff I got to get to Brandon, Josh. So all right. Move. Okay. Uh, so, my day, uh, 8 15, 8 30, wake up, first half hour of the day, no screens. You know, one, one, a good way to get around this is. Uh, turn on a buy a radio, young people. You've heard of a radio? They exist. They have radio programs on them. Go to sports radio and listen to your fucking listen to Stoudemire. Um, you, you told me you don't want me to wake up depressed, man. Have you seen Philadelphia sports scene? 
I'd be just like, I would go back to bed. <laughs> then to put on NPR, put Got on it. music, like put on something or if you want or not have silence. A lot of people say silent, like meditate. A lot of people say meditate for 20 minutes. You could go on forever by meditation, but whatever you want to do with your first half hour of the day, no screens, you know, do it, but just don't do screens. That's what I say. But anyways, that's what I do in my life. I try to not have screens. 9 a.m., it's screen time. And and uh, it's also like some form of caffeine time. Um, and that, that could be caffeine or it could be like yerba mate. Caffeine comes in yerba mate and it's less harsh on you and shit like that. Um, or tea or whatever. Or just a bunch of water or whatever wakes up your body. Your body needs like an hour to wake up. But whatever. And it's like nine, 9 o'clock, then I'm on screen. Um, and I'm talking to people. I'm interacting with people. Um, and I'm writing and I'm also editing sometimes, but I'm mainly writing and I do that all and, and I'll publish something, uh, three mornings out of the week on, uh, ink and one morning out of the week on entrepreneur. And then I'll work on other articles for different publications as well. I'll write for startup grinds blog. Are you writing for startup grinds blog? You guys, I should. Yeah. No, we, we're not. No, you know, my, did you meet Michael Gassiorek over at startup grind? It sounds actually, I no. Sounds familiar. I'm probably dead and can't put the face in the name. I should introduce you guys to uh, to him, and you guys should write for. You guys should I'll, write. I'm definitely down to put content on there. Definitely. I love Star of Grind. So you have like a 60 domain authority now at this point. Like they're they're doing pretty well, but um, oh. the whole thing is just wow. steadily risen. So yeah, I'll do. I usually go until like noon in in, in various stuff that I'm writing. Um, then I'll take an hour to an hour and a half long break. Then I'll do an hour or two of writing in the afternoon. Then. And that's like my work day. So yes, that's like a five hour work day. Um, so it's it's all right. Life is good. And then like in the evening, there will be like tonight at 7 p.m. I got my Burning Man camp meeting. There's gonna be like 100 of us there. Tomorrow night, um, I've got Blab actually at headquarters. The Blab headquarters in San Francisco is doing a meetup. The We're going to have is a, um, our next Blab on, not to cut you off. This is a shameless plug. Thursday, our Blab is with the CEO of Blab for the podcast on Blab. Nice. Very, very meta. Nice. Yeah, totally. And tomorrow they have a blab, uh, a blab meetup. Going to go to that. So I always try and like, not always, but because that's another thing about burnout. You don't want to always keep doing it. Like you gotta, you gotta try and make sure that your life is a little bit more chill. So not every night will I go to an event, but I do like to try and go to one or two events. Um, and yeah, so that's pretty much. And usually that's like at six or seven. Um, or sometimes there'll be a meeting in the middle of the day, and I'll go downtown too. Like I'm not always in the cave here with like totally dark like this, right? Um, I'm, there's several different workspaces that I'll go to. I'll spend day parts there. There's some clients that I have that I'll go to and I'll spend parts of days there. So that's, but that's a general idea of what my day is usually like. That's awesome, man. So, all right, last thing, how can people reach you or find out about you or read all the ridiculously amazing content you're putting out there? Uh, uh, just at Jay Boytnot. So at, it's right there a, at J B O I T N O T T on Twitter. That's the and I'll best put it way. In the show notes too. So everything you say will go in our actual comments notes. Exactly. Yeah, please. That's, that's the best way to, to do it is I'm always on Twitter. I'm always going to be on Twitter um, for as long as the freaking company exists, however long that is. And before it's bought by somebody after it just continues to not make any money, but um, we'll see how that goes. But yeah, at, at J Boyd, not. So, all right, and the last question, and I'll let you go, for what would be the first article you maybe wrote or content you created that you would recommend people who have never read anything you've done before to read first, to get an idea of who you are or, like, the writing style you have? Because I don't think people ask this question enough, and I'm really curious what your answer is. Mm. It would probably be one of the Inc. articles that I've written about uh, social media, just because I've been I've been doing social media for ten years, really. I mean, in some form, like going back to the '90s, you know, right? Like just basic things that eventually became social media existed back in the '90s, and and so probably one of my articles on on uh, oh yeah, I would say like probably I wrote an article about how uh, uh, Skrillex is a really is really good at content creation on especially on his Facebook page. He has like a couple million Facebook followers, and so. The, the contests that he comes up with, the interactive things that he asks his fans to do that he comes up with are really good. And it, it provides a lot of lessons for how you want to try and get millennials to give a shit about you uh, and two, how to be authentic. What, so that would probably. Where did you write that? Do you remember offhand? Uh, Inc. Inc. Magazine. So all you would do is look up Boytnot, B Y T N O T T, uh, on Google, Boytnot, and uh, Skrillex. And then it would be the first thing that would pop up. John Boytnot, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. 
Thank you, man. We are going to do this again. I'm not even saying when we do it. We're going to do this again. I don't know when. Yeah, we'll do I like it. you a lot. It'd be cool. Do you do any other thing besides Blab, or is Blab just like your jam? Right Blab now? is our jam uh, because it's cool to get real people's comments that you saw today, get people interactive. Then we get the video. We put the video on YouTube, and then we put all the audio. We'll post it, we'll, like edit it, put our intro in or ending, and then we'll post that on iTunes, SoundCloud. Again, Google one day when Google – realizes podcast a thing in the year like 2045 um but yeah it's it's awesome and there's your shameless plug for all the podcast listeners on how to reach us so it's very meta and this so john thank you dude seriously and the next time you're in philly or new york hit us up vice versa next time we're in the bay area where you're not in maui yeah sorry about that by the way yeah it's all good man. hey 